Here we go. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Thursday, January 5th, 2023 meeting of the Adina Housing and Redevelopment Authority. This is a um, meeting that is being broadcast uh, virtually as well. And so there's one opportunity to participate in the HRA meeting this morning, and that is to call in on conference. I'm gonna have the number put up on the screen here for community comment. There are no public hearings today, so you want up your one opportunity to call the HRA and express to the HRA any concerns they might have, or you might have, um, uh, about matters that are not on the agenda today or scheduled for a future public hearing, feel free to call in. And there's the number, 786-496-5601, conference pin number 255-3326. Press the pound sign and then press star one to speak. And then the uh, operator will get you into Director Benarat and get you in front of the HRA. Uh, having provided that information, we're gonna call the meeting to order and I'm going to ask Administrative Support Specialist Liz Olson to, um, uh, let's actually, let's, before we call, yeah, let's call the roll and call get the meeting set up here. Um, so, um, roll call please. Commissioner Risser. Here. Commissioner Jackson. Here. Commissioner Agnew. Here. Chair Hovland. Here. Next is the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next is the uh, uh, potential approval of the meeting agenda. We've got uh, an issue with uh, two new HRA members and one missing regular member. If you notice on the consent portion of the agenda, we've got some draft minutes of the meetings for December 6th, December 8th, and December 20th. We can't really act on those today because we don't have a sufficient number of folks to uh, that were in attendance at those meetings to, to deal with that issue <clears throat> on the agenda. So uh, I think we'll move those to the following uh, meeting of the HRA when we have a full complement of people here. And uh, then consent, uh, the consent agenda will just consist of existing items D through G. So is there a motion to um, amend the agenda for the HRA meeting this fifth day of January, 2023 to um, table the minutes and move them to the next meeting of the HRA? So moved. A second. Got a motion by Commissioner Jackson, second by Commissioner Agnew to uh, adopt a motion as stated to amend the agenda and move the draft minutes for the meeting dates of December 6th, 8th, and 20th to our next HRA meeting. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the motion as stated, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, and now back to the um, community comment. I think we can go right to community comment as long as we've approved the meeting agenda in its amended form. All right. Nobody in the audience. You want to step outside your staff role and offer up a few comments on anything? The weather or the, where to put your garbage container? <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. I do not yet have anyone on the phone either. Because there is a slight delay in the broadcast, I would recommend we wait a minute before moving on. My clock shows that it just turned to 736, so I'll come back to you at 737 or when I have a caller, whichever is first. All right. Thank you, Director Benarat. Folks, if you're listening in at all, there's the uh, number to call in and the conference pin number. All your instructions are there on the screen. It is now 7.37 and I still don't have a caller, so I think it's safe for you to move forward with your morning agenda. All right, thank you, Director Benarat. 
The next uh, matter in sequence on the agenda is always the executive director's response to any community comments that were made in the prior HRA meeting. And I see in the agenda clearly in red there were there were no comments there. In the were prior. No. So, if you want your yeah, there you had your voice heard this morning <laughs> in uh, short form. All right, let's move on to the consent agenda. What's rema remaining on the consent agenda items D through G? Is there a motion to? Uh, does anyone, uh, first of all, let me ask, does anybody on the HRA wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? All right. Is there a motion to adopt the items on the consent agenda, which is now uh, D, items D through G? So moved. Commissioner second. Risser moves, Commissioner Agnew seconds. The adoption of the consent agenda items D through G in a single motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the items on the consent agenda identified, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, next, we are on to the heart of the meeting, which is the reports and recommendations portion of the meeting. And um, Bill Neuendorf, our economic director, economic development director, gets to uh, provide the 2022 year in review. And so we're looking forward to that presentation. This is an informational and discussion item only, no action required. And then he's got a couple of other items on this agenda, this portion of the agenda as well. So. Manager Neuendorf, welcome. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Yes, good morning. Here we, here we go again. Everyone. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, um, this morning's presentations are not for action. They're simply for information and for discussion, if any. Um, uh, but we wanted to take advantage of this time together. Uh, we don't have any pressing business today, any action to approve of t today. But we wanted to get you prepared because over the next 12 months, you there will be several items in front of us. So we wanted to cover some of the basics. And um, uh, as always, myself, Stephanie Hawkinson, Scott Neal are here to answer any questions that you might have. So we're gonna start off with a year in, re year in review. Uh, this is a document we started putting together a few years ago to summarize some of the major activities of the HRA um, during the previous calendar year. And um, the, uh, the full report is in your packet. It's always posted on the, on the city's website as well. And I'll run through a I'll run through a, through a few highlights this morning. So we'll touch on our major accomplishments in 2022. We'll talk a little bit about TIF, tax increment financing, and we'll talk a, a little bit about our affordable housing trust fund. Um, so a lot of these accomplishments um, are, uh, 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 might not be fully built out today, but they've passed significant milestones to, the, to get to the point where they are. And, and the first one is the uh, execution of TIF agreements and financing commitments with Mortensen and, and Orion to transform the property at 70th in France where the U.S. Bank site is located. Uh, that's a, a massive private investment, almost a quarter of a billion dollars uh, to be invested into that property. Uh, that, when complete, will deliver new housing, new jobs, uh, new uh, business services, uh, all new public realm, uh, and really um, one of the first projects to abide uh, with, the, um, with the Southdale design principles, to take a large single parcel, split it up into four elements, and reposition that whole block uh, for the future. Um, so all of those agreements were executed last year, and the developer is putting the financing together uh, uh, at this time and expects to move forward in the spring. If you drive by the site, you'll notice that the first phase, the, the U.S. Bank branch, the new one, um, uh, is finished on the exterior. They're doing their interior uh, updates, and that should be open in the spring. Uh, once that uh, branch bank is open, then they'll start decommissioning the rest of that existing building, and, and the next phases will follow. Uh, the second one is in a similar situation, um, approval of a TIF agreement with Solheim Companies uh, for their second phase of apartments in the Pentagon Park District. Uh, this was just approved recently. Um, uh, staff has been working on this for a long time, uh, and the owners uh, and the HRA in general has been working on these properties since about 2014. Um, uh, when, when the current property owner was able to reassemble all of those parcels that had been foreclosed on um, into a single entity and start to strategize how to reposition them. Uh, 
So this is the second phase of, a, of apartment development on the north side of 77th Street. Of course, it includes uh, new commercial space on the first floor. And I think most importantly to the community is the, um, is the affordable housing that will, will be built there, as well as, as well as three different routes to connect from 77th Street to the Fred Richards Park. Um, uh, some routes for cars and trucks, a new main entrance to get to, the, to that uh, public facility, as well as to the uh, parking areas of the private businesses, uh, and also sidewalks and a shared street as well. Uh, so we expect to see that breaking ground later this year. Um, uh, at this point, the developer is working through financing and getting those, those details worked through. But again, that was a project that took a lot of effort on, 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 on the part of the HRA. This next one is actually under construction. Um, the uh, 4040 senior apartments on West 70th, West 70th Street. Uh, this is a parcel that had uh, become available in the marketplace. The, the HRA recognized that uh, it was uh, a, a location ripe for private uh, investment. And instead, we worked with the Adina Housing Foundation to secure the property um, and to have it redeveloped uh, as affordable senior housing. So that project is under construction uh, today. And one project was finished last year. Again, these projects take, take a long time to go from conception to financing and agreements and, and actually getting to the, to the ribbon cutting. But we celebrated that ribbon cutting of the, of the Sound on 76th Street Apartments by Aon. Uh, they finished that in, it was April or May of 2022. Uh, that's 70 units of affordable pricing of affordable housing at a variety of different price points. Um, uh, and that building is fully occupied and uh, uh, these, these buildings are um, leased up very quickly. There's strong demand for these types of facilities. And then a little bit smaller scale and making a shift. Uh, in 2022, we were able to work with the owner and the, and the operator at the Adina Theater and have that vacant facility be rehabbed, renovated, modernized, refurbished, uh, and then reopened. Um, so that one took a lot of work. Um, uh, the owner dug deep, the, uh, the operator dug deep, the city and the HRA got involved to, to a limited degree as well. Um, but that facility reopened to the public on October 1st. And if you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. It's a fantastic facility and, and it's nice to see it restored and, and back in service. Another one under construction uh, today, actually, is the Adina Chamber of Commerce's Adina Innovation Lab. It's a small business development center. Uh, the HRA stepped up in, in, a, in a new way for us. We provided the construction loan to actually build out the space. So those agreements were finalized uh, in November of last year. The, um, uh, uh, the chamber signed their leases and construction contracts and things are moving today. So uh, in fact, they actually submitted for their first construction draw earlier this week. Um, so we'll finance that, that construction build out to get the vacant space rehab to create new jobs in this new business center. Uh, and then upon completion, um, uh, the loan will be repaid back. Uh, except for a few portions that, that are forgivable if certain milestones are achieved. So we'll, we'll see how that goes over the next five years. Um, but it's nice to see that project underway. It should be opened. They're aiming for May, but I don't think we don't want to promise May yet. Sometimes delays happen, but it'll happen uh, by, by summer of this year. Would you go back to that slide, please? Um, up on the top, you see the recognizable City of Edina logo, and then there's that um, little logo for Spark, and then our, the Housing Redevelopment Authority name is underneath that. You might want to explain people, for folks in the audience or even some of our new HRA commissioners what the Spark yes, thanks for, fund thank, is. Thanks for bringing, bringing that up, um, and that is important. It's a new program that we offer. Uh, we just established it in 2021. Um, it stands for Special Project Projects and Redevelopment something. I forgot what the C is. <laughs> um, but it, it's a new fund that is, is essentially capital. Oh, capital. Um, special Project and Redevelopment Capital Fund. So these are special funds. They, they actually originated from the Southdale 2 TIF district 
when that district was decertified. There is a change in state law that, that coincided in 2021 that allowed the HRA to take any, any funds left in there within reason and, um, and reapply them to create jobs and do re redevelopment in the city. And so uh, uh, the Adina HRA took advantage of, of that legislation and established the Spark Fund. Uh, we started off with about $9.4 million available to make business investments uh, into Adina. Um, uh, the, the funds are, are um, they have some strings attached. Uh, this, the state law was, was explicit and some of the strings and so we make sure that we follow those. Um, but the benefit to the HRA is that in the next two years, we can use those monies to invest in other projects. We have until 2025 to allocate and direct those monies. Um, any funds that we don't um, allocate would be returned to Hanneman County. Um, so we're trying to get those dollars to be invested here in Edina is our goal. And so far we've, we've made two in, uh, three investments or three commitments. Uh, the Edina Theater, that was a source of funding to support that project. Um, the Innovation Lab and also the public road on the, um, on the second phase of the Solheim project. There's a $2 million pledge to build that new public road. Um, uh, and so there's still about $6 million left in this fund in 2023. And we'll expect to talk about that quite a bit uh, this year as well. Can I ask? Yes, go um, Is there an educational component that is attached to the Spark Fund's outreach to the Edina Public Schools, I thought was part of the Innovation Lab um, working with those students? Yeah, or good, it was the ARPA funds, maybe? Uh, good question. So there's nothing explicit in the SPARK program okay. um, with the public schools. Um, but in the agreement, where did that, where did that lie? Was it the ARPA? It was ARPA. Yeah. So for the purposes of today's conversation, the ARPA funds are not relevant, or is right. that... Okay, thank yeah, you. Yep, good question. The, the ARPA funds are, are administered by the city, okay. not by the HRA. So that's where that commitment lies. Thank you for the reminder. So when we talk about the ARPA funds, are you thinking about the, one, the funds we gave to Edina Ed Fund? Or? Um, for this project, I, I thought there was a component where the um, Chamber of Commerce was reaching out to Edina Public Schools. And that's true. Okay. Yeah, and they're going to try to set up a program with the school district, I think. But, it, but uh, our funding is more towards uh, the loan for the construction of the facility okay. as Got opposed it. to providing oh. any funding for the school district. Okay. Right, and, and that's a very important distinction. The HRA funds can be used to build things. They cannot be used for operational expenses. Okay. So when we build this new business development center, that's the place where other operations could happen that are funded from other folks. Thank you. I'll jump to the next one. In 2022, we also um, uh, uh, finished and uh, approved two new, two updated policies for the HRA. Uh, we updated the policy on the use of tax increment financing as well as the city's affordable housing uh, policy. Um, these policy updates were, were long in, in the wings. Uh, we've been working on those, uh, honestly, for about three years uh, in fits and starts as, as opportunities <laughs> arose. Um, but we're proud to have uh, actually finished those and, and secured approvals uh, in 2022. So, of course, those new policies are effective immediately. Um, they included changes uh, uh, to, get, to get more public outcome, public benefit uh, in the use of those programs. So those will be applied uh, immediately. Let's see, we'll try a new button here. Is that to, are you going to talk at all about TIF in the balance of your presentation? Uh, are you, are you? A little bit. Um, actually, in the second part of the program, where we have the intro to the HRA is where I've got more information about TIF, but happy to answer questions if you have them here. I just think it's worth pointing out, and you do a good job of this generally, explaining that uh, 
And it's in your report that for property taxes paid in 2022, only 1.1% of Edana's property tax base was included in the TIF district. Right, right. I've, I have a slide to that in a, okay. in a few minutes, so Good. I'll make sure I touch on that one. Uh, also in 2022, we, we made some huge advances on the old public work site in the Grandview district. Uh, long time project, uh, we actually brought forward proposal number 10 for the site. Um, uh, and we've secured preliminary site approval, which is a huge step. We haven't made it that far. Uh, we've got two sales contracts, one with United Properties and one with Jester Concepts for a restaurant uh, and for the senior housing. Uh, then the balance of the property would be a park or a public green space. Um, so uh, we meet with the developers uh, every two weeks as we continue to move forward on this. Um, expect to see some action there this year. Uh, not construction uh, yet, but uh, if financing goes well and everything stays on pace, we might see construction in the fall. Um, so there's still a lot of HRE involvement. The HRE owns the property, and as owner, we have some obligations to do some, per some paperwork with the Pollution con Control Agency and a lot of other uh, entitlement work to get the site ready to sell and then actually get it sold. Are you getting some positive reports from United Properties on the meetings they're having with folks that might want to live in the senior co-op? Yeah, good question. So um, since the, uh, since the uh, sales contract was executed, they've had probably a dozen sales meetings for the site. In order to, get to secure their financing, they need 65% of the units pre-sold uh, since it is an ownership product. Um, Right now, they are getting close to that. They're probably in the 80 or in the um, 55 to 60 percent. Um, so this, there's uh, uh, there is strong demand for this, the uh, for this product. The only uncertainty is just in the pricing, right? Like the, people express interest, they put on it. They're put on a list, but as I speak, they don't have firm pricing for the project yet. So when when folks put their name on the list. If they see a price that they're not happy with, they, they don't have to buy it. But there's been strong, it's been well received. There's been strong interest so far. Yep, that's what I've heard too. I heard that they're, I've heard they've had over 80 commitments, you know, in those in terms of those pledges, if you will. Yeah, it's at least that, if not triple digits. Yeah. We also finished a, a, a multi-year construction project in the Grandview District, uh, reconstructing Eden Avenue and parts of Arcadia, redoing the intersection. Redoing this or adding sidewalks where no sidewalks existed, uh, paving streets that, that it had not been done in, in years, adding curbs where there had been <laughs> never had been a curb. Um, uh, all of the all of these improvements were funded with with tax increment that was generated from that district. Um, the projects overall, the public public infrastructure projects, are probably 90% complete. The only thing left to do is to swing that pedestrian bridge over the railroad tracks and connect from the from the parking garage over to Arcadia. Uh, the infrastructure is in, is in place. The bridge is is being fabricated. Uh, we're still waiting for that final permit from the from the railroad to tell us what day we can drop that bridge in place. Uh, uh, but they indicate that will be uh, forthcoming. So it's nice to see those projects finished as well, uh, all funded by TIF rather than the general fund. Yeah, I'm, I'm having issues. Thank you. And then also on the housing front, we um, accomplished a lot of prog a lot of uh, projects as well, uh, and these are projects that Stephanie Hawkinson worked on. Um, but uh, Adina has the housing preservation uh, efforts, uh, so using um, some HRA funds to preserve existing housing. Thanks both single family and multifamily. So there's a variety of programs and actually we'll go through those in a little bit more detail in the second part of this program. Um, but as usual, it's been a busy year for Stephanie as, as she works to, um, to issue second mortgages, to help match up people that want to sell their homes but not have them torn down, have them be uh, rehabbed and resold or released. So another successful year there. I don't. Oh, there you go. 
And then, Mr. Chair and uh, HRA board, this is where I have some basic information about, about TIF. So, um, uh, this map shows, of course, the territory of the HRA. The territory uh, is the same as the city. Um, each of the blue masses here shows an existing tax increment district. Um, and just for historical reference, the yellow dots are locations of old TIF districts, um, districts that um, have been expired, uh, decertified. We currently have 11 active districts, and um, each one is established for a particular project or a particular purpose. And when you add all those things up, um, this bar chart shows the extent to which communities in Hennepin County use TIF to support development in their communities. So you'll see a dinosaur. Excuse me, uh, yes. Commissioner Jackson has a question. Oh, yes. yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if you could go back to the previous slide. Tell us more about what the Southeast Edina Redevelopment Project Area is. I looked at that map, and um, I'm like, I think at some point I've heard what that is, but I was really confused. Sure, sure thing. Um, it is confusing. That you, have, you have reason to be confused. Um, uh, the Southeast Edina Redevelopment Project Area was established in the early 1980s, so it's a legacy thing. Um, it was first established when we created the Edinburgh Park TIF District and the Centennial Lakes TIF District. And it's what, it's, it was, a, uh, it was a, a boundary that was required to be created by state law to use TIF for those projects. Over the decades, it was expanded to include all of the commercial nodes in the city. Um, and what it means today is uh, there are still some funds in the Centennial Lakes TIF account. And they can be invested in public projects within the boundaries uh, shown in green in that redevelopment project area. So historically, we've used those remaining funds um, uh, to build the public parking at 50th and France. That was an eligible use. Uh, again, they are restricted. We can't go and buy fire trucks and new staff and those types of things. We have to build things. Um, so as, as um, Calls came up for sidewalk improvements, and uh, in, in some areas, uh, we use those monies with that 4040 senior housing project. One of the um, one of the outcomes talking with neighbors was to expedite construction of a trail on a one block length of Valley View Road. Uh, that was not in any budget, and so we we went into this fund to build that road. Um, so the green boundary today is just the limits where those other funds can be used. Um, other than that, it has no other purpose. Can I ask, I'd like a follow-up question. Does this explain why there are no TIF districts outside of that boundary? Um, they're not really related, but primarily because um, TIF districts primarily happen in commercial districts, not in single-family neighborhoods be highly unusual to do a single family neighborhood TIF. Um, and there are some commercial industrial properties on the western edge of Edina, but they're not in a redevelopment phase. There's not a need to create TIF. So we, the, cities, or the city through the HRA has created TIF districts when there's a specific need. And those have come up um, primarily on the east side of town, which is the older side of, side of the community. When I joined the city in 2010, this district was really, it was very tight. Uh, it was just the, the extreme southeast corner around Centennial Lakes Park. We expanded it, I think, in about 2012. If that, does that sound right, Bill? Correct. And, and part of what uh, Mr. Newdorf was talking about, we wanted to capture other areas of potential economic and commercial activity. But we were also advised at that time that we could not expand it to include the entire city. Mm -hmm. So that's why you see the boundary that you see here, mm -hmm. and it's been stable since that time. I was going to offer up that same recollection mm -hmm. is that our public finance advisors, Ellers, stated that we could not include the entire boundaries of the city in that redevelopment district. So we tried to define it as broadly as we could without um, running a follow of state law. So when it comes to the use of TIF, um, I'll go back to this bar chart that compares Edina to several other peer communities in Hennepin County. About 1.1% of our overall tax capacity 
is located in, in a TIF district. So that's the portion that, that the, the term in the statute is captured. We capture that portion of, of the, uh, of the uh, tax capacity. By comparison, when you look at some of our, some of our other neighbors, um, St. Louis Park, Richfield have about 11 to 12 percent. Um, uh, Hopkins has about 9 percent. Bloomington has about 7 percent. Um, we try to keep it low. Um, there's no magic number. There's no magic goal. There's no right or wrong. Uh, and that number fluctuates every year based on the rising and falling property tax assessments or you know, the, the market value in the community. At a previous meeting, um, Commissioner uh, 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 Pierce asked to see that 1.1% in, in dollars. So we, re we retooled the chart to show the same thing in dollars um, because certainly some communities uh, have lower market value than Edina, some have higher. Um, but the 1.1% of our tax capacity equates to $1.9 million. Um, and again, by comparison, if you look at some of our neighbors, uh, Bloomington has about 12 million tied up um, in TIF districts. Uh, let's see, Richfield, Wyzetta, Minnetonka, Hopkins are all about 4 million. Again, there's no right or wrong, um, but that's what those numbers look like. It's nice to put it in context. And it was another successful year for a collection of, of uh, tax increment. Um, what this chart shows, it's confusing. I'm going to just focus on a couple lines here to, to kind of zero in. I'll show you, I want to highlight a good example, and I want to show you a, a lagging example. Uh, so what this shows is uh, the collection of, of incremental taxes over time. This chart does not include the base taxes that go to the school, the county, the, um, the city. It does not include the state taxes that goes directly to St. Paul and the state of Minnesota. It does not, it does not um, count the fiscal disparities either. Um, so the dark blue line is 50th in France. Uh, we finished that construction project, project of Nolan Mains and that north ramp on Market Street in 2018 through 2019. And then the following year, uh, it, it was assessed um, for something new rather than just semi-vacant public land. Um, and by public, I mean tax exempt, had not paid tax, property taxes in decades, generations, actually. Um, so over time, the, the blue line grows, which is exactly what you want to see a TIF district do. You want to see that increment be created. Uh, eventually, it'll level off when the project is finished. It has that first big jump. Um, it'll continue to go up for the next couple years as uh, apartments get, get leased, commercial spaces get leased and, and come on the tax rolls, and then it'll stabilize. And it'll increase a little bit every year, um, but it won't, it, it won't see another massive jump like it's seen in that first, uh, first situation. By comparison, the, gray, the dashed gray line is Pentagon Park. Um, that is the, the area of town that was hit the hardest by the pandemic. They lost a couple projects there, and that hurt. Just want to be honest about that. Um, so that project, that TIF district was created in 2014. The first tax collection started a few years after that, about four years after that. But you'll see there that the gray line doesn't have a big jump. It doesn't leap up yet. Um, and that's the lag due primarily to the pandemic at this point. Um, there's been lots of conversation. There's been some new projects approved recently. Um, so we are expecting a big jump, but probably not for another two or three years. Um, uh, what that means to the HRA, frankly, isn't a whole lot. What it means to the developer is that they're not getting paid <laughs> so that they, they've made about t over 20 million dollars in infrastructure investments into that site with the expectation that they would that we would use TIF to help reimburse them for that infrastructure but we only make payments on that note if something is there if something is built so we t we'll talk a lot about risk when we talk about TIF in Edina we try to keep that risk with the developer that's their business. That's what we what they do. We try to keep that risk low for the city. 
Um, so eventually, in, in the next couple of years, I, I do expect that district to, to change quite a bit and, and go upward in its, uh, in its tax value. Um, uh, but again, that's probably a few, year, few years away. Yes, Commissioner. Um, this might be a good place to ask, can you tell me what projects were involved with the Grandview TIF? Is that the Grandview the Square? Grandview two, the, the, well, the, the Grandview, Grandview 2 that's on here, yeah. And then does it include the Avador? I, I wasn't on the um, commission when we did that. Um, yeah, sure. So the Grandview 2 TIF district was created, um, I think, 2013. And <laughs> it includes, at the, it only included properties that were publicly owned at the time. So it included the old school district um, bus garage. It included the city's vacant land, and it included the parking garage behind Jerry's. Um, all, pro all properties that seemed ripe for some kind of improvement. Um, so the, on this chart, it's shown in the orange, and the big jump there is the Avador. So um, all of these properties used to be tax exempt in the district. Um, and the benefit of TIF on a tax exempt property is that when, it's, when it becomes public or partially public, all the districts benefit because now the school district actually gets taxes. They get a base tax that they never received before. Um, and then the tax increment goes in, in the TIF district to, to pay for the obligations there. So the orange line strictly shows the Avador and the, the new revenues from the Avador. Um, we do expect that to jump once the senior housing gets finished on the, on the uh, HRA's property but that's what's in that district. Terrific, thank you. So the other benefit for the school district was they sold the property that they owned that the Avador is constructed on for about $4 million, and now they get tax revenue on top of it on an incremental basis because there's a piece of private development there where there used to be public property before. So they got a, exactly. they got a twofer out of it. Exactly. So this next phase, I just want to touch on um, three or four projects here. W when the city uses TIF, we, we do that typically by pledging a TIF note, which is basically an IOU. It's a pledge to make a future payment. So there's a handful of, of TIF notes that, that have already been issued, and then there's a few more that we expect to issue in the next couple years. So in the year in, re year in review, we have updates on the status of each of those notes. Um, for the Pentagon Village, we have three TIF notes. Um, the image here shows the, the five-phase project in full build-out. Right now, phase was, one is finished. All the infrastructure, the retail, the, the public parking garage, the public uh, plaza area. Um, phase three, the housing is under construction. That should open by, the, I think, the end of this year. Um, that's really interesting to watch that one go up. Um, phase two is the hotel. That should be breaking ground in 2023. That was one project that was just decimated by the pandemic. They were ready to go in, in 2020, and they saw what was happening and decided it wasn't the right time to make that, that investment. So that one got delayed. Um, phase four is a new bank that, I, that was just uh, received its site plan approval a couple months ago. So I think that one should go forward this spring as well. The toughest one um, on this project, project site is the last phase, the office. Uh, that market was stagnant for a few years, um, but it's rebounding. I mean, we've, we've heard a lot about new proposed office in Edina, and I think we'll hear more. Um, but those TIF notes, um, we've pledged about $18 million uh, as the principal amount to be repaid to the developer. And so far, we've paid about a quarter of a million dollars. So again, the risk. The city, we, the HRA fulfilled our obligation, but the developer has, um, has held that debt with not much payment. And that's part of their, of their role. So I think a good thing to talk about on Pentagon Village is whether you're on the south side, which we call Pentagon Village, or on the north side, where we saw the Solheim projects, and I think the Total acreage was close to 40 acres. Because of the use of TIF to provide for public improvements like the park and the infrastructure and the ramp, 
these other investments that you just described were taking property that was on the tax rolls, as I recall, at about $7 million for that entire acreage. And when it's all built out, it'll have a value of in excess north of $100 million. That's fair to say. Far, far north of $100 million. Yeah. yeah. Commissioner. I feel like I keep asking the newbie questions, but I That's am a newbie. Um, along 77th, I know that the bike master plan indicated there'd be a trail. And I'm wondering, when we issue TIF for development, are we including or thinking about that? And, and I'm not seeing signs of where a trail would go. And my big concern is being able, well, people being able to go you know, across the highway along 77th so they can get into the Cahill, Cahill area or Cahill can come across to Fred Richards. I know there's the pathway, uh, but it's hard to get to that, the Three Rivers pathway. Mm -hmm. So if, this is, sorry, Rambly, no, that, newbie. No, it's, a it's a great question. So yeah, there's, there had been a lot of conversation about that, mostly by the city council though. Um, okay. That site plan type of question is really more connected to the rezoning and the approval of site plans. Um, but when we did the master planning, um, I think the second time we did the master, the master planning for this whole area, there was a lot of conversation about that. Right now, the weak link is getting across the on-ramp. So th the way that some of those existing buildings were built the way the highway was built and the way the on-ramps and off-ramps are built. Um, there, as I recall, it's a giant electrical transformer that's right where the sidewalk would go. <laughs> so in order to get that sidewalk in, you'd have to move the transformer. And to move the transformer, you'd have to move the on-ramp or the private building that is only 10 or 15 years old. Um, there's not a good place to do that. Um, that's part of the reason why when, that, uh, when the, uh, the bike trail proposal came through, I think it was very well embraced by the city because it allowed us to jump the highway without having to rebuild that whole bridge. Um, I, my recollection is that the bridge over Highway 100 is in pretty darn good condition. I don't expect it to be rebuilt in my lifetime. Um, so that is a, a shortcoming of that area. Um, in new projects, I think we try to forecast a little bit better, um, but when that, uh, it, it's the condo building where the pizza place is and the daycare is going in, when that was built, it, I don't think Edina was as focused on multimodal options as we have become the last 10 years or so. Thank you. Yes, Executive yeah, Director Neal. <clears throat> a good idea of, of talking about risk. Um, but it is good to know that when, when you hear about cities that get themselves in trouble with tax increment financing, one of the practices that it could be going on there is that there are cities that go out and borrow money and give that to the developer up front. And then when the tax receipts come in, they pay themselves back and they use that to pay that debt service back. We don't, we would never, ever, ever consider that. Um, and that's not something that Dinah has ever done in its in its history, but it is something that that pops up in in the media from time to time when when you hear about cities using TIF inappropriately or or making bad judgments about that. And when you hear Manager Noondorf talk about risk shifting, uh, you'll hear that the term "pay go," pay as you go note mm -hmm. in the future, and that's that refers to that risk shift to the developer away from the city. So that they don't get they don't get uh, any performance out of the IOU that we give them until there's a building uh, until they they perform up to the expectations of the development agreement. So I'll jump to the to the next one. Um, uh, the Lorian Apartments on 44th in France was built a few years ago. Uh, we use tax increment financing to help. Um, spark that redevelopment. Um, it had been lagging for, for a few years. Um, so we issued that TIF note in 2021, made our first payment recently. Uh, it's about a $30 million project. And uh, um, we've made a similar payment to this project as we have to Pentagon Park. 
just over 200,000. So, so far this one is basically on track. Uh, commercial leasing lagged a little bit with the pandemic. Um, residential leasing has been, has been solid on this one. Um, and w part of the reason we, that we were compelled to use TIF on this project was that it checked so many boxes that were identified in the 44th and France small area plan. It provides public parking, public plaza space, new public sidewalks, and important to a lot of people in that area, it removed all the overhead power lines. We don't even think about those anymore, but um, as part of this agreement, the developer agreed to remove the, the power poles about one block from his site, about one block south, and about one block north. And those had been um, a priority for the business community because it's a narrow sidewalk, and when you've got an 18-inch power pole right in the middle of it, it makes it hard. So um, that's part of the reason why we moved on this one. And then the last... If you go back to that one, Bill, I think another interesting thing to note is it's a little bit tangential, but you can see the papered over space on the first floor there on the corner. They wanted to put a restaurant in there, uh, but uh, the size of the restaurant required a certain amount of parking under our existing parking regulations that the Planning Commission subsequently worked on when Commissioner Agnew was chair. Um, and we couldn't accommodate the parking necessary within the public uh, spaces that were in the building. And so the neighbors worried about on-street parking and if you remember, I don't know if you saw a lot of the no red cow signs in the neighborhood at the time, but we turned on the request for a a restaurant there under the old parking regulations and we haven't had the developer come back and talk to us since the uh, new parking regulations have been implemented so that may be something we see at some point in time too yeah and and the anchor tenant there actually just opened this week uh it's a yoga stu a yoga studio um and so they just opened on uh, either monday or tuesday was their was their first day oh so. okay good to hear so he's got his, all of his retail space leased up? He has one small, tiny space left. Um, but yeah, he has um, a beauty facility and then the, the fitness facility um, and then a small space left on the southern edge. And then the last uh, active TIF note that we have is for the 50th and France district uh, and the Nolan Mains project. Uh, as you might recall, this was a city-owned property. Uh, it used to be the um, the center parking garage built in 1976, um, the bicentennial, bicentennial year. Um, we, we issued an RFP and selected uh, the development team from the list of, or from the group of folks that responded. And eventually upon completion, we issued a, a, a note for about $10 million, just a smidge over 10. Um, and that is to reimburse them for all the extraordinary project costs. What made this one, what made so many costs was rather than just having one layer of their own private parking, we had them add a second layer of public parking. That was absolutely, absolutely essential for this. Uh, and then the way that the whole site was created to really replicate and expand that network of small sidewalks and, and um, public realm spaces rather than one massive building it actually looks like three smaller buildings with uh, pedestrian routes going through those. Uh, the construction was complicated because most of the neighboring properties are one inch away from this property. Um, so to build a two level underground parking deck, there is a lot of stabilization so that the neighboring buildings weren't damaged. Uh, and a lot of extra uh, thought and effort went in to make sure that customers could still get to those neighboring businesses through temporary walkways and, and things like that during that two-year construction phase. Um, there was a lot of conversation about this one back in the day. You were probably all on your radar on, on some level or another. Um, uh, but so far, this has uh, performed quite successfully. Um, uh, the residential is fully leased, and ha I'm happy to say all the retail is now fully leased. And uh, the, la the last vacant space was occupied the week before Christmas. So it's nice to see that happen. Um, so far, from, from a note payment perspective, we've paid about half a million on the $10 million pledge. 
I think one of the extraordinary amenities down there is something I didn't think about too much at the time was that underground parking that we told them that we wanted a public level of underground parking. So now you can go and park underneath 50th in France, underneath Nolan Mains, in a heated underground space and not pay at all. Right. Not, it's totally free parking. It's yep. just it's astounding, really, that a, yeah. Yeah, it's a, really a, good, a municipality good. has a situation like that where we've got free underground heated parking for residents that want to park and shop at 50th in France. Yeah, it, it's so far it's doing exactly what we had hoped it would do. And, they, and they, the public seems to really appreciate the changes we made in the ramp across the street as well. That, that's heavily used now, or it was not that well used before. Right, right, yeah. So as part of the Nolan Mains project, the city expanded the public parking garage on the other side of the street. So we used a combination to fund that um, parking garage. It was about $12 million. So we used about $6 million from that from that Centennial Lakes Fund because that wasn't in the city budget. We weren't going to levy the taxpayers for that. So we used the, the Centennial Lakes monies. And then the, the remaining money to, to build the expansion came from the developers. We sold the property for $6.1 and then took that money and reinvested it back into the public uh, infrastructure there. Um, just want to have these on your radar. There's another six projects uh, that we've pledged uh, the use of TIF. And those projects are, for the most part, under construction today. So in the next year or two, we do expect to issue more TIF notes. Um, uh, the old Perkins site called Maison Green uh, is on that list. The two phases of 70th in France, uh, the, the current U.S. Bank site, the office phase and the housing infrastructure phase. The sound apartments, I, we brought that one up. It's finished. Um, we're still doing some final paperwork on that one, um, but we expect to issue that note this year. Uh, the 4040 senior apartments, uh, we'll have a note on that. And then the uh, Pentagon Park North or the second phase of Solheim, there'll be a TIF note for that. Um, also on our list is a, is a pledge to the old 72nd in France um, project. Um, uh, that project is in default. And um, as you may recall, uh, that was a pledge from 2019. The property has been sold at least once, if not twice since then. A new development team recently secured zoning approvals for the first phase of a new project. So um, there's still this lingering debt obligation, um, but it's in default, so that'll get cleaned up this year. Um, and I do expect to talk about uh, the use of TIF on this, on this new development uh, this year as well. So just so that's on your radar. Let's see, I'm going to skip some of these things because we're... Um, uh, the, the last slide in, in this deck is just a, a quick overview of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And this is something that um, uh, is part of the mission of the HRA, um, Housing and Redevelop Redevelopment Authority. Um, so several years ago, uh, we formally established a trust fund that meant that when affordable, affordable housing monies are received, they're deposited into a, into a separate account, which we'd always done, but we formalized it a few years ago and declared that those funds can only be used for affordable housing. Um, to date, um, we've collected about eight and a half million dollars from real estate developers to fund affordable housing in Edina. Um, uh, and that's, that's cash in the bank. That's not pledges, that's not future promises, that's monies that have, have, been, that have been deposited. And the, uh, the box on the right shows how those funds have been used. Um, there's still a balance of about two and a half million uh, in that account, um, but we've provided a loan to the Nolan Mains project um, uh, for some of their affordable units. Uh, that's an interest-bearing loan. We established a, a program to preserve NOAA, or naturally occurring affordable housing, um, using the 4D tax program. Um, uh, we have the housing preservation program and the housing rehab program that are really focused on single family homes. Um, and then the first generation mortgage, which is uh, actually administered through the Housing Foundation, but the HRA provided the funds to them to, um, to help uh, first home buyers get their homes here in Edina. 
Uh, and along the way, we, we've also acquired some property. The site of the 4040 project, I think, was acquired using trust fund monies. Um, Stephanie's saying no. Um, which property was acquired? 425 Jeff Jefferson. So, um, Mr. Jackson has a question for you. Sure. So, um, uh, that's the affordable housing trust fund. It's used exclusively for for affordable housing, and uh, uh, we can. I mentioned it in my opening remarks that there was it was an active year last year for these new programs, and we expect it to be another active year this year, uh, to the extent that funds are available. It's, thank you, Mr. Sure. Chair. This is actually from Manager Hawkinson. The 4D NOAA Preservation Program, that is to give money to um, do environmental upgrades, like new windows and heating systems and things. Am I remembering that correctly? Chair, Commissioner, yes, in part. Okay. Um, it is to, uh, um, in order for NOAA, Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing, to get a affordable housing property tax classification, there has to be um, a grant or money from a municipality that makes them eligible to do so. It's one of, if they're not a Section 8, there are four areas in which they could qualify. One is if a city gives them money. So part of it is like a grant to allow them to sign up. Um, then the other part, once they sign up and are approved, then they do get some energy efficient improvement funds out of this as well. Terrific. Thank you so much. So with that, that was a very extended <laughs> conversation about the year in review. We kind of morphed some of what is an HRA and what is TIF and all that kind of stuff into it. But that's, we, that's what we intended to do this morning. Since we have this time with you, happy to answer your questions. Um, but that concludes the year in review. The full document is on your packet. It'll be on the website later today. And um, uh, uh, I'm happy to jump to the next phase if, if you are, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think please keep moving because we're gonna we're gonna be short shorting you on time. I think um, it's, it's you know, a half an hour half to go. Of this next presentation already, so we're all we're all good. All right. I see you were projecting, or at least somebody was, uh, forty-five minutes. And we've got a half an hour, so. Yeah. No, I meant twenty-five minutes. Um, Okay, so this is a new presentation, um, but we felt it was important to do because there's some new commissioners and even Commissioner Jackson and Pierce are on the newer side. Um, so there's a lot of ingrained knowledge uh, that we wanted to make sure it gets conveyed and it doesn't just happen today. Today, staff is here for you, Manager Neal is, is here and ourselves, happy to answer questions. But we wanted to give a brief overview of what is the HRA? Why are we sitting here on a Thursday morning rather than a Tuesday night? Um, and so I'll run, I'll run through a little bit of the history of the HRA, but really focus more on the scope and authority of the HRA as opposed to the city council. See, before I forget, you know, I think be, there would be value in sending these three presentations out individually to the commissioners as opposed to just having them uh, part of the agenda and this, this will disappear over time you know, in the computer system, unless you try to retrieve, you would try, you'd have to go retrieve it. It'll be part of a packet. It'd be part of a packet for right. this date. Yeah, but I think sending it to us individually would be good. Yeah. Happy to do that. Okay. Okay, so what is an HRA? Um, so Housing and Redevelopment Authority. So fundamentally, it's still a public public agency, but it's different from the city but it's only enabled by the city. So it's a separate agency that's enabled by the city government and it has specific statutory powers to undertake the type of projects that are within its scope. So housing and redevelopment. Um, uh, for this presentation, I really relied more on the League of Minnesota Cities handbook which kind of takes state statute and puts it in language that most people can understand, except for the attorneys that are, that are present. Um, but I think fundamentally, um, the way to, that we think about the HRA is not as, a rate, not as a regulator, right? Like the city council regulates. We enforce parking violations and building codes and fire safety codes and zoning codes. That's the city. The HRA is not a regulatory agency, 
we're created more as a funder or a partner or even a developer. Some HRAs actually undertake their own development projects for the, on behalf of the community. Um, so that's the best way to think about the difference between the city council and your role as HRA commissioners. Um, so sometimes you have to make a, a shift there, but think of yourself more as a funder of a program, not a decider of is the sidewalk wide enough, is the bike trail in the right place, that's more on the city council. It's difficult to, to isolate both of those interests because you're the same body, and that was done intentionally back in the early 70s. Um, but when we meet with you about the HRA conversations, they'll really be focused on real estate. What's the financing look like? If the city council and the planning commission liked a project enough to approve it, does the HRA like the project enough to fund it or to partially fund it? So that's the next, the next layer. And the HRA has been around since 1974. Um, it was first created to promote uh, that first round of redevelopment at 50th and France. Um, I was not here at the time, but um, in the late 60s and early 70s, in addition to some of the amazing businesses, there was a whole lot of surface parking lot and a whole lot of gas stations at 50th and France. It was not that regional class A shopping destination that it grew into. <coughs> So in the early 70s, the HRA was created to use TIF to help remove some of the gas stations and replace them with the condominium buildings that have been around since the early 70s. <laughs> um, so that was the first big round. Um, reviewing the, the resolutions that were approved back in the time, it was intentionally created to coincide with the city council. It was not, in, it was not created to be a separate group of five people making a separate group of decisions. It was created to give the city council more authority and more power to help finance projects that made sense for the community. So it's been around since, since that time. And the scope uh, is, as we had our earlier discussion, the, uh, our scope is throughout the entire city from this, the same geography, the same borders, although the vast majority of our conversations happen around commercial districts. And there's a number of different um, activities that the HRA can do. Um, a similar situation for state statute, the HRA can do things that statute gives us power to do. If it's not in the statute, we can't do it. Um, sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's limiting. But I, I categorize these into, into three, main, three, main situ, three main situations, real estate, finance, and planning. So real estate, uh, the HRA, uh, can own land, we can buy land, we can sell land, we can lease land. Um, different cities use different types. Um, some cities actually buy properties and lease them and have a revenue stream coming in. Um, uh, and we can buy and sell property as it makes sense for, de for redevelopment. For finance, um, we can undertake any number of our construction projects, um, whether they're public projects, whether they're roads, sewers, uh, or buildings that we want to lease. We, we have authority to, to finance any of those um, or to help private developers do the same thing. Um, we can also uh, implement programs using TIF. Uh, there, there's, a, there's several different types of TIF districts. We can, do, we can uh, uh, access any of those. And then the fundamental though is, is really um, focusing on affordable housing and that's focused on low income and moderate income housing. Um, as the title implies, redevelopment and housing authority. Uh, and then there's also some language about planning efforts that we can do. We don't typically apply these in a Edina um, because the city has whole departments <laughs> that do this. Well, we, we try not to replicate or duplicate the service. So, um, uh, but, but however, we do have authority, we could um, if there was a lot of distressed housing, we could come up with a plan to rehab distressed neighborhoods of town and do more aggressive code enforcement and those types of things. We already have a building department funded by the city that does that, so we don't duplicate that effort. So it's those general scopes of activities. And then the types of, the types of tools or powers that the HRA has uh, follows uh, the types of activities we can, we can do. So, um, I categorize these into staffing, finances, and then, then some miscellaneous other ones. Um, 
Uh, we could employ, the HRA could employ staff and an executive director. We can hire consultants, advisors as needed. In Edina, we use city staff to help fulfill the role of the HRA. There's no dedicated HRA staff. Um, it's myself and Stephanie and Carrie Teague and Chad Milner and of course Scott Neal. It's the same staff that we pay for once, no need to have a separate staff. Um, but we do rely a lot on consultants. We try to keep our staffing low, and so we rely a lot on, on, on local consultants with tremendous expertise in the field, legal advisors and finance advisors and housing advisors. And when it comes to, to debt, there's a number of, of different tools we can use when it's appropriate. Uh, we can issue traditional debt, uh, we can issue bonds, We've done both over the years. We can levy property taxes, which we just started doing about four years ago. Um, we can charge fees where it's appropriate. Um, we can take advantage of state and federal programs that have financial assistance. Uh, of course, the use of TIF. Um, that's mostly on the revenue side. And then, of course, we can, we can spend money as, as well. Um, and finally, uh, uh, for some reason, the, the League of Minnesota Cities always includes this one. Um, if we wanted to, the HRA has the ability to, ability to sue somebody, or we also have the ability to be sued by somebody. Uh, and that includes the power to use eminent domain if necessary. It's rarely necessary, um, but if we had to go that route, we could. We, we try to avoid it, but it's possible. Um, in Edina, the, the main thing I want to focus on here is is how we apply these activities and these powers. It's really in pursuit of public benefit that at this point in time result in transformational change. Um, so much of the city, especially I, th I think of the greater Southdale district, it was built out at a time where everyone was expected to drive there in their private car, park it in a parking lot and do their business. Um, when that area was built, there was very little thought given to sidewalks or bicycles or even frankly <coughs> uh, mass transit. So as we see new projects in that area, as well as other neighborhoods, we're looking at not just tearing a building down and building the same thing, but it's really a transformational change to be much more multimodal, much more sustainable in our outlook. So as the HRA funds projects or, or undertakes activities, we really look at delivering some of those public benefits that are not funded by anything else. Um, so we look at multimodal, we look at a lot, a lot of the public realm improvements, um, rather than um, just having a two-foot strip of grass that turns into weeds in front of a building, we'd rather have a generous boulevard with trees and landscaping and have it be a place you want to visit um, with a sidewalk that isn't just your standard skinny little four-foot sidewalk. It's a more gracious, welcoming sidewalk. Um, but that all costs, mo that all costs money. Um, so that's where we get involved. Public parking is another one we get involved in a lot. Um, uh, but this, the city of Edina and the HRA has been in the public parking business since at least 1968. That's the year that we built the first parking deck at 50th and France. Um, it was a one level deck. It's a south ramp. It's been expanded on three times over the generations. Um, but if you still go to that first lower level and you look up in the ceiling, that part looks different from anything else at 50th and France. That's what got us in the public parking business. It's an, ex it's an expensive business line that doesn't create revenue, but we found it to be essential to, for the success of our commercial districts. Um, and uh, of course, some of the other outcomes that we look at, removing blight, sometimes there are blighted buildings in Edina. I'm not proud to say that, but it's factual. Um, and there are some contaminants in both the soil and the water. It's expensive to, re to, to remove it. But for the health of the community overall, as well as the environment, it's very important to remove it. So we, we try to work with state agencies as best we can to help fund that. But the state usually gets involved when the local folks get involved. So we all kind of take up our share. But it's, it's those public benefits that really, um, we, that we try to focus on. There's a ton of input and oversight into the HRA. Uh, we go through the city's standard budget review process and our capital improvement program. And then there's paperwork. Um, there's paperwork, paperwork with the county. There's paperwork with the state um, to make sure that everything is audited and made public and transparent. We also, of course, engage with a lot of conversation with our school districts in our county. When we use TIF districts, 
um, both of those entities are affected. Um, it's usually to a neutral degree, but we want to we want to work with our folks, not surprise them. So we do work with our, with the Richfield schools and the Edina schools quite a bit. And over the decades uh, since the HRA has been around, there are some massive uh, uh, success stories to tell. And literally, the books have been written about this. Um, Adina projects are featured in several real estate and development type handbooks of best example, like best in nation examples. Um, the Grandview Square number one was an early use of TIF in the, in the early 80s. That was on the south side of Jerry's. Uh, that was an old industrial area. Um, that was the last, one of the last times I think the city used eminent domain was to secure a holdout unit there. Um, but that delivered new, new housing, a new senior center, a new park, new office space, a new library and a, on all the road network to go through it. Um, Centennial Lakes, of course, the office, the residential, the park, the retail, all enabled through the HRA. Edinburgh Park, uh, the housing, the hotel, the, the indoor park, the outdoor park, the office center, the residential, all enabled by the HRA. And then more recently, the, the image on the bottom right is the sound apartments, the sound on 76th. So um, there's a strong legacy um, of the HRA in Edina, and sometimes we overlook that, um, but it's very important. And as we look at, at achieving community goals and public benefit, we go back to the documents that brought us to the point that we are. Uh, the Vision Edina document, the comprehensive plan from 2018 to 2020, and then the whole variety of small area plans from the Greater Southdale Plan to the 44th Plan to the Cahill Plan. Um, we also have sustainability guidelines, bike master plans. So those are the kind of documents we go to when we look at delivering public benefits through HRA financing. Uh, and we continue to offer a variety of programs. Um, uh, I can go through these in some detail, but I think I'll just leave it for your questions first. But the, the programs are, are lumped in a, into two categories two categories, the redevelopment type programs, which is typically TIF, SPARC, and maintenance districts, and then the housing programs, the preservation, the 4D, the NOAA, the, the multifamily uh, inclusionary type of programs. Uh, we talked about TIF already, so don't do, won't do that again. Um, but I, I do want to spend a few more minutes on SPARC, and, and Mr. Chair, you brought this up earlier. Um, this is a really important tool, and we started a conversation in December, but now there's some, some new faces here, so I just want to touch on that briefly. This is, I think, the second time that the HRA had a legacy fund to support community goals. When the Centennial Lakes project was finished a decade ago, uh, at, the, at the completion of that project, there was a nest egg of I think it was at one point about 15 to 17 million dollars available to fund public improvements in Edina. This was cash in the bank that had already been paid, didn't have to borrow it, didn't have to levy the taxpayers for it, it was already there. And so over the decades, uh, your predecessors were always very thankful to the people that made those decisions 20 years in the past that left them a nest egg. And we're in a similar situation this year. Um, when the Southdale District was created in 2012, um, <coughs> those decisions resulted in another nest egg that's here today. We call it the SPARC program. Um, so this is something, uh, it does expire. I mentioned that there is about 9.4 million, and we, if we allocate it between today, actually between last year and 2025, we can invest it. If we don't allocate it, we'll return it back to the county. We'd much rather have those dollars spent here than somewhere else in Hennepin County. Um, but those dollars are TIF dollars, so they have all the, all the TIF rules that apply to them, and they can be used to create jobs and build things. To, just to keep it simple, create jobs, build things. Um, but this legislation that governs this gives, a, gives the HRA vast authority to decide what's the best way to deploy that money. Um, we could give it away as grants, we could give it away as, or we could, we could loan it at a low interest, we could loan it at high interest, we could, um, we could do forgivable loans. So depending on the project, there's, sometimes there's, there's uh, 
good times to do forgivable loans versus regular loans versus grants. Um, but do expect to hear more about that in the, in the first quarter of this year. Um, we want to make sure that we've got a, str a strategy to deploy those funds this year because 2025 is going to be here before we know it. Um, so we want to see if we can identify all those potential projects this year so that the funds are deployed in 2024 and 2025 before this expires. So that, that's a, a big program and a fantastic opportunity for the community. Commissioner Jackson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it seems to me in previous discussions that we've had, we talked about loans, and if these funds are loaned out, the, um, the click-off date goes away. Is that correct? Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, yeah great, great. Um, thanks for bringing that up. Um, so th the funds today are heavily restricted by state law. Um, if we use them as a loan, whether the interest rate is 2% or 6%, um, when it's repaid, the monies that come back are no longer encumbered by the, state by the state restrictions that are there today. So what we hope to do is create a situation like we had with the old Centennial Lakes di District, is that when these funds get repaid back to the HRA, we can reuse them again. So help one group of investments today, have them repaid over time, over five or 10 years, but when the funds are repaid, we can help another group of businesses and another investment and another, another better outcome. So that's what we're hoping to create. We're just working through how to best do that. And we'll need your guidance on that as well. And one of the discussions we had relating to that is between staff and our consultants, we have the capacity and the um, knowledge to do that, correct? Right, yeah. correct. I think that was one of the great discoveries about this program is that as long as we lend the money out by the drop dead date or we would have to otherwise turn the money over to the county, even if that money is repaid after the drop dead date, we get to use it again right. and again and again. Right. Yes. Commissioner. Could Commissioner. Um, building things include renovating extant housing? It doesn't have to be tear down and rebuild, right? Could it be... Um, modifications to buildings, setting up a program maybe to make um, structures more accessible to wheelchairs um, or just an idea, yeah. something like that. Yeah, great question. Um, so the answer is maybe. <laughs> so the, the challenge in state law is that the funds have to be used to build something and to create jobs. So if there's some kind of, to build a commercial building, you can say you're building jobs, you're creating jobs. To just, to just rehab a house, I don't know if like a short-term remodel job that's there for three weeks and then gone, I don't know if that would qualify as a job. Um, the intention was to create a like a year-long job or a permanent job. That's something we could look into further with our legal advisors, but so far we've been really looking at, at more, um, at, lar at larger scale programs. For the um, idea that, that, you, that you brought up, we do have a separate fund for that. Okay. So that's, um, Stephanie Hawkinson works on that through the Housing Preservation Program. There's funds there that do exactly what you, what you describe. Um, and I, I wanna wind down here again, being respectful of time, um, uh, but just one wild card to throw out at you, uh, in case you didn't know, <laughs> the HRA also owns parking facilities and we maintain them and they're expensive. <laughs> Um, uh, we owned uh, the parking facilities uh, behind Jerry's in the Grandview District and in the uh, 50th and France, France District. We have three of the, of the structures there. So the, um, uh, the HRA oversees, for the most part, the management and repairs of those. Um, but again, the, your predecessors had the foresight to think about the cost. And so there's agreements in place that the HRA engages the staff to do the work, the costs for the most part are borne by the benefiting property owners. So at 50th in France, we spend about 430,000 every year in maintenance costs of those parking facilities. At the end of the year, we divvy it, it up based on a pro rata share and send an additional invoice to each of the commercial property owners in that area. So there's very little that you'll need to do about that, but just 
thought you might want to know that you own a bunch of parking garages. And then uh, the same comment on, on the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Uh, I won't go through, go through that again. But this is one, uh, another one of those legacy programs that um, I mentioned so far we've collected eight and a half million dollars. We've allocated most of it, but there's still a few million dollars left. So Ms. Hawkinson is always looking for a new, for the next project or the next, next new thing. Um, but next year we're expecting more projects to come in, or not next year, this year, uh, 2023. So um, uh, if Lifetime uh, does submit a, a full proposal for their project at, at Southdale, you know, that, as you might recall, that was a proposal for about 200 or 250 units top of market, luxury, luxury, luxury top of market housing in that one. They would probably use the buy-in. So that'd be another several million contributed into, into this fund that you would have the discretion to decide what's the best way to, to deploy those funds in the community. Um, so there's uh, that 8.5 million is not stagnant. It will, it will grow over time. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, um, Stephanie has um, created several really good programs to address rehab and resale and preservation and a variety of things and continues to, to keep her eyes open on, on other ways to, to support affordable housing throughout Edina. Um, well, that's where I'm gonna wrap it up. I'm happy to uh, stand for any other questions. There's a lot out there. Sorry for droning on, it's early. <laughs> um, but wanted to make sure that you had the background to start uh, uh, to start strongly because we expect proposals that require action in the next couple weeks. So hang on. Commissioner, sure. Jackson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, for Manager Hawkinson. We recently joined a program with a nonprofit that was focused on um, hiring and using um, uh, people of color contractors. I can't remember the terminology or anything, but I, it, was, it was such an innovative thing. Could you tell us a little bit about what that is? And I don't know if it was on that list or not. Chair Commissioners, um, sadly, we had a partnership with LISC and it had been fully supported by local LISC. National LISC couldn't get their heads wrapped around it. Okay. So that project is on pause. And we are working at figuring out one of the, I mean, it was an emerging developer program. And um, it was also to help increase the capacity of homes within reach. Um, so it was a two-pronged program. The LISC portion is on pause and we are working to see how we can resurrect it in another way. Okay, thank you. I hope you'll call on us if we can be of help with that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Risser. In reviewing the material for today, I did see a slide that showed two houses and it had to do with the preservation program. And one was a classic 1950 Rambler and then the other was a, um, I don't know that. I, I am really familiar with the 1950 style and one of my concerns is when we see projects that could result in removing these. Um, it appears they're classified with the 50s as a single story, but indeed there's a story below ground. And a lot of them have a walkout. And um, I've been really thinking about this for a while and it seems that this crosses over areas of concern that involve sustainability, environmental issues. We've got homes that were initially created you know, with hardwood floors, um, then those were covered up with carpet. But these are very durable homes, and I feel like we're kind of losing that in some of the language. So I've been thinking about language that is out there, that it, and if there's maybe a, a sheet that would underscore the real strengths of this form of architecture. The other form of architecture I don't know that much about, and I was wondering if, you know, perhaps I could sit down with you and learn more about that architectural style and other in that era and maybe just wrap my head around the different types of housing in Edina that make up those that you are really interested in preserving. If I may make a comment, 
I don't know if I begged a comment. No, um, we are beholden to who's willing to sell to us in this program. Um, so this, you know, people can choose to sell their home to a developer. They can choose to sell it to another homeowner. They can choose to sell to us. We are one option. Um, so when an interesting seller um, approaches us saying that they want their home preserved for a new family, we send our partner, which is currently just Homes Within Reach, they go and they inspect it to make sure the home fits their criteria, typically three bedrooms, typically one plus bath. Um, but architectural style has not been one of the check boxes um, with regards to whether or not they are acquired for this preservation program. So um, I can't say much about that other than we are, it's who's wanting to sell to us. And actually, I wasn't thinking about that context. I was thinking about uh, when proposals come before us and they may result in housing that is considered affordable being removed. So it was a very different scenario, oh. not the other one. Uh, but just being able, I, I feel I have a, a lack of understanding of the strengths of, and I, I would really like to understand more about all of the, you know, the basic homes that you would, our, our city would be interested in acquiring and what those strengths are, because I feel like I understand it for one segment of it, but I don't for the other. Manager Neal. Executive uh, Director Neal. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to note that given the time of today's meeting, we can easily shift uh, item C and in even the Executive Director's report to our next meeting on the 19th. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, do any of the commissioners have any comments they want to make? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. A second. Right, we got a motion by Commissioner Jackson, second by Commissioner Agnew to adjourn the meeting of the HRA this fifth day of January 2023. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adjourning the meeting say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. HRA meeting for Thursday, January 5th, 2023 stands adjourned. Mr. Thanks for that, Manager Neundorf. Thank you for that really thorough presentation.